Chief Justice. You used the term coward and you discount his manifesto. What do you think of this suspect? I think what the, my opinion of the suspect is unprintable. Um, but but you're right. Um, the, the the manifesto I think speaks for itself in terms of the evidence of a uh, of a depraved and abandoned mind and heart, uh, and and the cowardly way that he ambushed uh, your public servants. Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, what we're gonna do is we're going to look at the manhunt of Christopher Dorner. This one is pretty damn shocking, so get comfortable because he essentially went on a rampage for about a week in California. There were a lot of shootings, a lot of deaths, and this is pretty much just a uh, generally chilling case all round, so... It's pretty exciting, but uh, not really in the good way. As usual, we'll get into the whole shebang, the who, what, why, where, when. Roll the intro. So before we get into this epic manhunt, which, let me tell you, gets crazier the longer it went on, who are we talking about? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about Christopher Dorner. Christopher was born in New York and grew up in Southern California. Christopher was the only African American student in his school from first grade to seventh grade when he got into fights due to his race. When he was a teenager, Christopher decided his calling was to become a police officer and he joined a youth program offered by the police department in La Palma, Orange County. Christopher graduated from Southern Utah University in 2001 with a major in political science and a minor in psychology. While there, he also played uh, football running back for the university from 99 to 2000, so he was a big guy uh, and good for him. Christopher joined the United States Navy Reserves in 2002 after he left university eventually reaching the rank of lieutenant. During his time there, he received a Navy Rifle Marksmanship Ribbon and a Navy Pistol Shot Ribbon. Oof, as you can imagine, that will come into it later, him uh, being really good at the old, you know, pew pew. Now, while he was a Naval Reservist, he joined up with the LAPD Open Up, entering the police academy in 2005. Neighbours of Christopher described him as admired, well-liked, and a man who usually kept to himself. He had been married, no kids, uh, he divorced in 2007. Christopher, he was someone who made friends just effortlessly. He was a nice guy, always had a big smile on his face, but um, a lot of uh, ex-girlfriends would also say he could just turn on them like in an instant. He had some issues, let's say. Now this is when the not so fun begins, in 2007. In July of that year, Christopher, as he was still in his probationary period, so paired with a training officer by the name of Therese Evans, they were both called to the Doubletree Hotel in San Pedro after a report of a disturbance. Now, Teresa didn't really think much of Christopher and his police abilities. She thought he was a bit sloppy, a bit clumsy. He had accidentally shot himself in the hand at the police academy. But he had those ribbons. He had once told her that the LAPD had discriminated against him as a black man, and he intended to sue. Alright, so the event in question that really set off, what would happen? The offender was a man named Christopher Gettler, who suffered from mental health issues. They arrested him and that was that. Not really though. After Teresa warned Christopher that he needed to improve his police work, Christopher would file a complaint against Teresa Evans of kicking Christopher Gettler during the arrest after Gettler was tased and had given up resisting. The LAPD would open an investigation, and one of the things that really went against Christopher during this was that he waited a couple of weeks before reporting that Teresa kicked this guy, and also the fact that it kind of seemed like he was doing it in revenge because against Teresa because she said he needed to improve in a couple of areas. It comes up again and again when we're talking about Christopher. He was a guy who kept like a mental list in his mind of people who had wronged him, and he was someone who was always out for revenge. Three hotel employees who witnessed most of the incident were then interviewed by the LAPD detectives, and they claimed they didn't see the training officer kick the man. Gettler, he was brought to the police station and given medical treatment for injuries to his face, but at the time, he didn't mention that he'd been kicked. But he would later say he was kicked, 
kind of. What I mean by that is Gettler later told his father he was kicked, and during a videotaped interview with Christopher's attorney, he again said he was. Uh, being uh, interviewed and tape recorded with his permission is Christopher Gettler. Is that correct, Correct, Chris? Yeah. Okay. Now, I want to ask you about the, uh, the uh, police contact that you had with the, uh, at the Doubletree Hotel. Do you remember that? Mm, yeah. Okay. Do you remember being uh, taken into custody by uh, the police? Uh-huh. Okay, do you, do you remember uh, whether uh, there was a struggle? Mm -hmm. And um, at, at during that struggle, uh, were you kicked in the face? Mm -hmm. Did you have to say yes or no? Yes. Okay. And do you remember uh, how many times you were kicked in the face? Once. Okay, and do you remember where you were kicked in the face? Um, uh, right here. Okay, and uh, do you remember who kicked you in the face? Um, an officer. Do you remember what, what sex? Was it a male or female? It was a female. However, when Gettler testified at Christopher's disciplinary hearing, his responses to questioning were described as generally incoherent and non-responsive. So okay, anyway, it's kind of hard to tell if he actually was kicked by Teresa, whether this incident happened. Let's move on. So the investigation would decide that there's no kicking, and that Christopher had lied. And in 2008, he was fired from the police service. Fired for what they say was false statements, which is pretty darn harsh, but I don't know. He would appeal, helped by former police captain, now attorney, Randall Kwan, but get nowhere. Essentially, it was a he said, she said, and the police stuck with the training officer rather than the probie. After this, Christopher found himself in a deep depression. He was in his home in Las Vegas, isolated from family, cut off from friends, with nothing to do but seethe. An ex-girlfriend had posted a warning on the website don'tdatingirl.com, saying, if you value your sanity, stay away from this guy. She described him as super paranoid, always thinking someone's out to get him. And so if he was that kind of person, you can imagine how getting fired for whether it was true or not would make him very angry. It began on the 1st of February 2013. Anderson Cooper, of all people, received a package at the CNN office that basically gave Christopher's entire case against the LAPD. No! No! Do it, do it! Two days later, the bodies of Monica Kwan and her fiancé, Keith Lawrence, were found shot to death in Keith's car outside their condo in Irvine. Both were riddled with bullets and had been shot in the back of the head, execution style. The police saw that Monica still had a diamond ring on her finger, so they knew it wasn't a robbery. It was a close-range ambush. There was no evidence of a fight. Neither of them had enemies, both worked regular jobs. She was a basketball coach at Cal State Fullerton. Keith was an officer in the Department of Public Safety. They had gotten engaged days earlier. They asked Monica's father, Randall Kwan, who might want to hurt his daughter. He had been the first Chinese American captain at the LAPD and had run a squad targeting Asian gangs. In recent years, he had worked as a lawyer representing cops facing termination and Randall couldn't think of anyone who would want to hurt him or his family. During the investigation into this double homicide, police wondered why no one had heard the gunshots. It happened right outside an apartment building, you know, surrounded by people. Someone must have heard something, but they didn't. So then the police began to think that maybe the ambusher, the attacker, had used a silencer during the murders. They also found out that someone had been stalking Monica in the few days previous. The very next day, Christopher posted his manifesto online. It was an 11,000 word document. He posted it from the High View Inn and Suites in Manhattan Beach. He said his motive for the shootings of Monica and Keith and all the shootings to come were to clear his name. Sure, it makes sense. He vowed to hunt members of the Board of Rights who had heard his case. He would hunt the LAPD hierarchy 
that had sanctioned his punishment. He was convinced that his former lawyer, Randall Kwan, had been loyal to the LAPD rather than to him. He would hunt him and his loved ones. He listed those who had wronged him throughout his life, and also those he would miss, because he knew he wasn't coming out of what was to come alive. He would miss friends, colleagues, the fact that he wouldn't get to see the hangover tree. He dodged a bullet there. He would also miss Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, Chris Christie, George H.W. Bush, General Petraeus, Tim Tebow, Bill Cosby, Anthony Bourdain, and Charlie Sheen, among others. Times have changed since 2013, all right. Mainly, in his manifesto, he named a shitload of police officers who were on his list of enemies. He, uh, essentially just declared war on the LAPD. Former police officer, and you hear this police chief in LA, Charlie Back, talking, he was asked, uh, you know, this guy was trained. He, he worked with the LA Police Department for a couple of years, not to mention he's a marksman, ex-reservist. Right. So he's trained well. He, he appears to know what he's doing. He is. I mean, he was a, an officer, not an enlisted man, but an officer in the Naval Reserve. And so, yeah, he, he knows what he's doing. Uh, he knows weapons. He's got a he's, he's a rifle marksman, pistol marksman in the reserves. He's been very well trained. You know, LAPD, some of the best trained officers in the country. He was there from 2005 to 2008. And I tell you, this manifesto, it scares the hell out of me. Let's get to it. We have a couple chunks. I want to just read this first one here. Quote, uh, you better have all your officers, radio, phone, muster on or off duty every hour on the hour. You may have the resources and manpower, but you are reactive and predictable. Goes on. I have the strength and benefits of being unpredictable, unconventional and unforgiving. <clears throat> on the 5th of February, Christopher checked into the naval base in San Diego. He was named a prime suspect in the double homicide on the 6th, and he checked out of the naval base on that same day. Or rather, he just left the naval base. He skipped uh, regular checkout procedures, probably because he knew he was, you know, things were getting hot. Christopher tried to steal a boat in San Diego, telling the 81-year-old owner, Carlos Caprioglio, while pointing a handgun at him, I don't want to kill you, but you're gonna take me to Mexico. However, Christopher, knowing nothing about sailing, threw the rope that moored the boat into the water instead of onto the dock. The rope became entangled in the propeller. So his escape attempt to Mexico uh, went nowhere. He tied up the owner, stole his cell phone, and just disappeared. On the 7th of February, Two LAPD officers were driving at 1am to a protection detail for one of the officers named in Christopher's manifesto, when they were stopped by a man named Lee McDaniel. He told the two officers he'd seen a guy who looked just like Christopher at the gas station. Maybe you should, uh, you know, go take a look. The two officers, they popped over and they started following a suspicious looking pickup. When? All of a sudden, Christopher got out of the pickup and just opened up on the two cops. Firing at them with his assault rifle, he grazed the forehead of one officer. He then sped away. 20 minutes later, two officers of the neighboring police department were ambushed while stopped at a red light. Christopher opened up with 13 rounds of armor-piercing ammunition, and one officer, Michael Crane, died shortly after the shooting. The other was rushed to a nearby hospital in critical condition for surgery, but he survived. It sounds like your officers were completely ambushed. Was there any intelligence? Was there any uh, warning? Given that the LAPD was looking for this suspect, did those officers in that car last night on their patrol have any idea that there was a chance this suspect might do something like yes. that? Yes. That uh, should be on extra alert. Yesterday evening, the uh, the information uh, was disseminated by the LAPD <laughs> via the, the FBI's uh, JREC, the Joint Regional Intelligence Center. So all law enforcement agencies in the region were aware that we disseminated the information about the suspect and, and his vehicle and his intent uh, to to our officers, as I believe all agencies did last night. We are concentrating on, on calls for service that are of a high priority, that are uh, uh, threats to public safety. Essentially, we're not going to go on, dark, on barking dog calls today. We saw we saw at some of the some of the perimeter and the scenes that officers from all different sort of agencies were carrying shotguns and rifles. I mean how. Uh, how on edge are officers?
answers. I mean, they, they're being targeted, so how on edge would they be? Well, I don't know that anybody's on edge, but certainly uh, officers are prepared, officers are alert. This is a this is a somewhat unprecedented, or at least a very rare occurrence for us, uh, where you have a, a trained and, and heavily armed uh, person who is who is hunting uh, for police officers. As you can imagine, LA turned into a bit of a war zone while this was going on. Twice, two times, police opened up on people they thought were Christopher. That's how kind of paranoid everybody became, especially the police. Just to go back a little bit, you know, this has left cops so jittery in the area, and there was actually a shooting that was based on mistaken identity. Cops thought that they had this guy, and that resulted in a shooting. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, Ryan, what happened was we were talking about those security details. Well, in Torrance, California, in the Los Angeles area, the police were on watch for one of the men, men mentioned in the list. A truck pulled up. They suspected for a moment that this was the vehicle belonging to Dorner. Basically, they opened fire. They hit two newspaper, well, a newspaper delivery man was hit in the hand. The other one was okay. And they opened fire on another vehicle in Torrance. No incident, no injuries there, but uh, an innocent victim all this as uh, police were indeed on very high alert rides. Then, at 8.30 a.m. on February 7th, Christopher's burnt-out truck was found about 80 miles from Los Angeles in Big Bear Lake. Inside the truck, deputies found the blackened parts of two AR-15 assault rifles, a charred portion of a Glock handgun, and the remains of a tent, a survival knife, and a camping stove. Scattered through the truck and in the surrounding snow were hundreds of high-caliber rifle rounds that had exploded in the fire. And Christopher Dorner had escaped into the mountains. Authorities would offer a $1 million reward for information leading to the capture of Christopher Dorner, but he wouldn't be captured. They'd never take Christopher alive. Good morning, Dan, from snowy Southern California. Bad weather here has made it tough on the search efforts. Authorities had to call their troops off the mountain last night, but they are out there in force first thing this morning. So far, though, the only fresh glimpse of the fugitive were new pictures taken two weeks ago. Surveillance cameras captured these images of Christopher Dorner. The trouble is, they were taken two weeks ago in Orange County, not far from where Monica Kwan and her fiancé Keith Lawrence were murdered last Sunday. The last photos taken of Dorner before he disappeared. Signs like these, armed and dangerous, are on every freeway here, but so far no one has spotted him. Near blizzard conditions here in Big Bear Lake haven't helped. No eye in the sky for one thing. In this weather, the helicopters can't fly. On the ground, not much better. We're going to continue searching until either we discover that he left the mountain or we find him, one of the two. Five days after Christopher's truck was found burnt out, Jim and Karen Reynolds stumbled upon him hiding in a cabin. He tied them up, and when he left, they called 911. Stealing their car, a chase by police quickly began. He managed to evade them, but crashed the car. Then, San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department deputies responded to a report of a carjacking of a truck at 12.20 p.m. and began looking for the vehicle on the ground and from the air. Thankfully, the truck's driver was not harmed. I could tell it was uh, Mr. Dorner. Uh, he came out of the snow at me with his rifle pointed at me. I wasn't going very fast, so I stopped, put my truck in park, put my hands up, and he came up and he said, I don't want to hurt you. Just get out of your truck and start walking and take your dog. And that's what I did. I said, can I, take, can I get her leash? And he said, no, just start walking. It, it was clear from his demeanor that I wasn't one of his targets, and he just needed a vehicle, and I was happy to oblige. When the truck was spotted, a chase began, with Christopher driving to and hiding in the cabin. Christopher then opened fire on two officers, hitting both and killing one, Detective Jeremiah McKay.
Christopher, knowing his time was up, then barricaded himself inside the cabin, and it was surrounded by police. Police initially attempted to force Christopher out of the cabin by using tear gas and demanding over loudspeakers that he surrender. When he didn't respond, police used a demolition vehicle to knock down most of the walls of the building. They then shot pyrotechnic tear gas canisters into the cabin, which resulted in the cabin catching fire. Shortly after, a single gunshot was heard from inside the cabin, and it burned throughout the night. The next day, the police found Christopher's charred remains. Before we put that uh, pyrotechnic chemical agent in, we made numerous PA announcements identifying him by name, asking him to surrender, telling, us, telling him who we were, and asking him to come out, and then the, the pyrotechnic chemical agent was inserted. Uh, numerous assault weapons were recovered, as well as numerous uh, semi-automatic handguns, one of which is a sniper rifle, a bolt action, 308 caliber, which is considered a very uh, dangerous and high-powered uh, weapon. During the autopsy yesterday, uh, the a doctor who conducted the process concluded that the cause of death was a single gunshot wound to the head. We are not at this point ready to uh, speak about the manner of death and tell you whether or not that it was as a result of uh, a self-inflicted wound or, um, or another round. We will tell you that while we are still comp uh, compiling the information and putting our reports together, the information that we have right now seems to indicate that the wound that uh, took Christopher Dorner's life was self-inflicted. Christopher's crusade achieved what he wanted, kind of. On Facebook, pages sprung up praising Christopher Dorner as a folk hero who had dared to defy the law enforcement establishment. LAPD was prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner yesterday. They burned him alive. Apparently, burning people alive is now considered appropriate behavior for the police. From the very beginning, Dorner had found plenty of sympathizers. I just want to start off by saying that I perfectly support 100% what Chris Dorner is doing. I read this manifesto, and I basically, I believe him. On Facebook, more than 18,000 likes for a page titled, We Stand with Christopher Dorner. On Instagram, the rapper Ab Soul spoke for many when he said this about Dorner's rampage. This was a necessary evil. God bless you, sir. People like anti-heroes, and we have a history of rooting for everybody from Bonnie and Clyde and uh, Butch Cassidy. USC professor Karen North studies the intersection of psychology and social media. One of the things that social media has allowed us to do is to join conversations and not be as accountable for our opinions. He portrayed the LAPD as a hotpot of racism, and he was the vigilante exposing the corruption of the police. He wasn't though. He was a murderer, and whatever wrongs had been done to Christopher, just or unjust, his revenge wasn't worth it. Four people died, two of them completely innocent civilians. It made me realize you are my winning lotto ticket. You're my best friend, you're my girlfriend, and I've had you all this time, so it's about time to cash you in. I'm worth so, million. you're worth Billy. more than a million, Billy. So, <laughs> what in the world? You Monica, this. Lisa Kwan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, open the box. Would you marry me? Yeah. He was a cold blooded. Killer. He had serious issues and a legitimate, maybe, gripe with the LAPD, but was this the way to go about dealing with it on a rampage across the city? During the course of the manhunt, the LAPD decided to review the Christopher Dorner firing. The conclusion was the same. He had told a lie about his training officer and his badge had been properly stripped. Was it though, really? I mean, probably. If this was how he acted after he lost his job going on a rampage, who knows what kind of damage he could have done if he had a, you know, a badge on him. I don't know. And so ends the story of Christopher Dorner.
thank you so, so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, please let me know your thoughts on this case in the usual place, and I will see you as always real soon in the next video. Take care of yourselves out there. Mike out.